Our next speaker this morning is Dr. Daniel Hewins. Daniel's uh, currently an assistant professor of biology, specializing in ecosystem ecology at Rhode Island College in Providence, Rhode Island. From 2013 to 2016, Dr. Hewins was a postdoctoral fellow at the Rangeland Research Institute in the Department of Agricultural Food and Nutritional Science at the University of Alberta in Edmonton. He's worked alongside researchers and government personnel to measure and report the effect of livestock grazing on carbon and nutrient cycling in the grasslands of central and southern Alberta. His dissertation research focused on carbon and nutrient cycling in desert grasslands and the effect of shrub encroachment and associated soil redistribution on leaf litter de decomposition. Please join me invite in inviting Dr. Hewins to the podium. Thank you for the uh, introduction and um, thank you all for being here. I know it's uh, having worked in, in grasslands and in rangelands uh, and in, in agricultural lands for the last several years, I know it's a very busy time uh, of year. And so when I was, it was interesting, when I was uh, packing my bags from, from Providence to, to come up here, I noticed uh, on the local news broadcast that they mentioned that uh, Prime Minister Trudeau would be uh, visiting Providence, Rhode Island today. So it was a little bit of an about face. I thought, well, he must not be coming to my talk then. So uh, I'm glad that you all are here. And when I realized that Prime Minister Trudeau was going to be spending time with our Vice President uh, Mike Pence and a host of American politicians, I, I, I came to realize I'll be in much better company here uh, than he is there. So uh, thank you for, for having me. Thank you for taking the time out uh, from your busy schedules to be here. I'm going to talk about uh, some research that uh, I've done with my colleagues uh, Edward Bork at the University of Alberta and Cameron Carlisle, uh, focused on valuing the ecological goods and services that native prairies uh, provide uh, to society as a whole. And so the onus for this research, or the, the start of this research, really came about three, four years ago when we were approached by uh, groups that represented Alberta's uh, livestock producers. And what they were telling us was, you know, many of us run mixed farms. We produce canola. Uh, we also raise livestock. We're getting incentives for the land that we raise, uh, that we grow canola on, uh, but there's no incentive, there's no program for uh, all of the ecological goods and services that our native prairie land is providing to society, and that includes uh, a wide range of, of EGNS, as we call them. And so I'll go into those, um, and we'll look at some comparisons uh, between uh, what's happening on rangelands and, and croplands in Alberta. And so when I talk about EGNS or ecological goods and services, these are uh, benefits to society as a result of the sheer existence of, of grasslands. And these can be uh, summarized or generalized as uh, water purification, uh, of course, carbon and greenhouse gas uh, storage and sequestration, uh, pollination, uh, those pollinators that live in grasslands will pollinate uh, canola, for example. Uh, in addition, we know that grasslands produce uh, forage uh, for livestock, and they're also a great habitat for a wide range of animals and, and native species, native plants. Um, and so, you know, grasslands are providing quite a bit for society as a whole, uh, just as much as they're producing uh, and providing EGNS for, for those of you uh, here. And so there's been uh, some discussion about really needing uh, data sets that span both a uh, wide range of space because grasslands are complex and also having many, many replicates. And so one of the goals of our project was to sample uh, throughout the extremely diverse range of, of southern and central Alberta. And so here you can see on our map we have uh, the different natural subregions of Alberta from the uh, dry southeast corner all the way to the uh, wetter uh, Rocky Mountain foothills. And so what we did was we sampled 114 grassland sites uh, in association with Alberta Environment and Parks. And at each of these 114 grassland sites, we had exclosures within rangelands uh, that were at least 25 years old, uh, many of them on the order of 60 uh, years old. And so we teamed up with Alberta Environment and Parks, and we assessed uh, plant biomass, so the initial carbon, uh, that carbon that's fixed from the atmosphere by plants, uh, the composition and diversity of those plants, so who's there, uh, 
um, as well as carbon stocks and carbon pools. And so the, the uh, onus on this was to understand the when, where, and how uh, carbon is changing in response to uh, land uses like, uh, like livestock grazing and converting lands uh, for, uh, for cropland. And so here we span, uh, span the gamut of Alberta's uh, fairly diverse grassland regions. And so, as I mentioned, at each of these sites, we have uh, grazing exclosures. Here we can see a few photographs uh, just to show and highlight these. These are within uh, pastures that are leased and grazed annually. And so here we can see a fenced area uh, inside of this exclosure. We would, have it, we would expect to have a different plant community, a non-grazed plant community, uh, in comparison to this outside. Here we can see along this fence line, uh, recently grazed uh, grassland here. Uh, and an exclosure that's kept grazing uh, off of that small plot of land uh, for many, many years. And so here's our first data slide. We're interested in uh, plant diversity. And so what we noticed here was that plant diversity really peaked in moderate to high rainfall areas. Uh, here we have on our axis the number of species uh, that make up the community on our y-axis. And on our x-axis, we have a range of natural subregions from the dry mixed grass prairie, uh, the driest region will always be here on the left, to the wettest, the upper foothills uh, region, the foothills fescue area of Alberta. And what we noticed is that diversity increased with long-term exposure to grazing in moderate rainfall regions. So here we have uh, non-grazed in black and grazed in, in white uh, bars here, and we can see a statistically significant increase in plant diversity under grazing. Um, in those moderate rainfall environments. Uh, in all of the other regions, we didn't see uh, any change in diversity as a result of grazing, and so we saw uh, no effect of grazing there on, on uh, plant diversity. And so then that begs the question, well, what's changing under grazing? And so here we have uh, a diversity index, a Shannon's uh, diversity index, and we have uh, precipitation on our x-axis. And so we can see that uh, introduced species here represent about 10% of the community. And so grazing likely facilitated the increase of introduced species, um, but only under uh, wet environmental conditions. Um, but that's not to say that introduced species are bad, and we'll get into how uh, carbon responded uh, to grazing a little bit later on. But in semi-arid grasslands with uh, you know, less than 14 inches of rain per year, we saw uh, no increase in, in uh, introduced species, and that's likely because they're locked out of many of those environments uh, due to, uh, likely due to low uh, rainfall. And so here we can kind of see the increase in uh, introduced species with wetter uh, conditions here. And so how does grazing, how does livestock grazing affect grassland productivity? We just saw how it affects the community composition uh, but we also wanted to see how grazing affects uh, the biomass, the amount of, of carbon, the amount of herbage on the landscape. And so grazing enhanced productivity in the highest rainfall areas of southern Alberta. So when we look again, uh, here we have total biomass, the amount of, of biomass on the landscape, uh, the dry mixed grass all the way down to our wetter environments, the upper foothills region. And here we can see that grazing enhanced productivity uh, in areas uh, where there's high rainfall in southwestern Alberta, close to the Rocky Mountains. Uh, and introduced species, those species may play a role in uh, this peak in biomass. So here we see generally no change as a result of grazing. We see some trends here, uh, you know, but we have many, many samples. Uh, and then we start to see statistically significant increases in productivity as a result of livestock grazing. So mo ultimately more biomass on the landscape when we're grazing that landscape. In addition, we saw another benefit of grazing here. Grazing was tied to lower shrub encroachment in areas uh, in the Rocky Mountain regions. And so we saw the largest reductions uh, in uh, shrub encroachment in woody plant biomass uh, in these uh, wetter environments under grazing. So here's woody cover, uh, the percentage of the landscape that's covered by shrubs. Uh, in our dry region, all the way up through to our foothills fescue, we generally saw no statistically significant difference in uh, woody plants. But then when we get up into the montane and upper foothills region, we actually see an increase in shrub encroachment without grazing. So where we have grazing, we're actually keeping those uh, woody plants out of our 
grasslands. And so that's a, a fairly uh, important aspect when it comes to raising livestock in the mountain grassland regions. Uh, shrub encroachment, as we've seen uh, from a published study in 2009, uh, shrub encroachment has reduced grasslands in Alberta's Rocky Mountains, uh, in the Rocky Mountain Forest Reserve in particular, by 58% of the area, uh, lowering forage productivity by as much as 70%. So if we're continuously grazing the landscape uh, keeping those shrubs from encroaching, then we're going to maintain uh, forage productivity uh, in, those, in those grasslands in the Rocky Mountain uh, Forest Preserve. And so here we can just see a few photos from the Rocky Mountain Forest Preserve of some grassland regions surrounded by woody plants, and it's easy to imagine how those woody plants could encroach into those grasslands uh, if livestock aren't present to, to take them out. And so, we're going to look at uh, rangelands and, and carbon storage. Um, and so we want to mitigate, ultimately, many of us want to mitigate the rising carbon dioxide levels or the greenhouse effect. Um, we know from, from meta-analyses, from large-scale studies, that grasslands store anywhere from 10 to 30 percent of the world's organic carbon uh, in their soils. Uh, temperate grasslands make up about 8 percent of the Earth's surface, and they contain more than 300 gigatons of carbon. Um, about nine gigatons of that is in uh, plant bi biomass on the surface, but about 295 gigatons of that carbon is actually below ground in the soil where we can't see it. Um, and so, you know, grasslands play an outsized role, especially these temperate grasslands that make up, you know, only about 8% of the Earth's uh, surface, but they're holding quite a bit of carbon, as much as 30% uh, of the organic carbon is in, in grassland regions. And so that begs the question then, why do grasslands hold so much carbon? How do they hold so much carbon? And a lot of it is going on uh, below our feet. Perennial grasslands have particularly high uh, root to shoot ratios, we call them. So they can have as many as uh, seven parts root to one part shoot. Um, and so we can see a study from uh, Matador, Saskatchewan with that result. Another study uh, cited shows that they have a four to one uh, root to shoot ratio in other regions. So depending on the species, depending on the region, the investment in roots is really high. Um, and that's a direct line to putting carbon into the soil where it's much more stable uh, than it would be on the surface. Um, and so grasslands, you know, they've accumulated these massive, massive carbon sinks, uh, carbon pools. Uh, and then we can see that, that translates into dark, rich uh, organic soils. And so what changes that soil carbon? Um, and so cultivation, uh, many studies have shown when you break a virgin uh, prairie soil, uh, you can lead to that rapid loss, that exponential curve that was discussed by uh, John in the previous talk. 30 to 50 percent of that, that soil carbon will be lost uh, almost immediately uh, as a result of exposure of that rich organic soil to oxygen and the uh, oxidation and breakdown of organic matter uh, in the soil. This is just um, one of the costs of, of breaking uh, a virgin uh, prairie soil. And this is one of the reasons why we're trying to generate data to protect the grasslands, protect the native grasslands that are still in existence uh, in Alberta. And so some data from the furnace plots in southwestern and south southern Alberta. Uh, we, they initiated uh, continuous wheat cropping, um, which led to the reduction of about 19% of grassland carbon, um, and so about 1.7 tons carbon per hectare uh, per year for the first four years, uh, and then we saw you know, about 0.32 tons carbon uh, for the next uh, several years after that, um, and so we saw a loss, a net loss of carbon here. We've also seen uh, modest declines uh, in foothills fescue regions, and so here we have uh, soil carbon was 20 to 30 percent less uh, five to six years after conversion uh, from grassland uh, with favorable moisture. And so here we can see on our axis the amounts of carbon um, concentrations. And then we have uh, several different uh, species that were seeded here. So we have uh, native grassland, we have smooth brome, um, we have uh, alfalfa, uh, orchard grass, and uh, continuous wheat. And so we see uh, when we go to continuous wheat here, we have a loss of about 30% of carbon from the baseline uh, from native uh, prairie soils. And so in, uh, in areas with less favorable precipitation, 
uh, we have more, greater losses of soil carbon. So soil carbon loss was about 30 to 40 percent uh, five to six years after the conversion uh, of an arid grassland. And so here we can see uh, an arid grassland, and then when we converted that to uh, different agronomic species, the losses in, in soil carbon as a result of that. Um, and so these were published uh, in 2003. And so one of the reasons for this is that tame forages generally have less effective uh, ca carbon storage because they invest less in their root structures. So tame forages have lower root mass uh, and organic matter uh, when compared to, to native grasses. And so here we can see uh, tame forage versus native uh, prairie. Uh, and we can look at the uh, root mass in grams of roots per meter squared. Uh, and so we can see here that the uh, organic matter is about 5.3% uh, in, in mi native mixed grass, about 4% here in uh, tame forage, and ultimately a much less mass, much less uh, of that root to shoot ratio is in, in the roots there. And so there's less uh, carbon going into uh, those soils. So we also measured this uh, in our own study in Alberta across a wide range of, of crop fields. And what we saw was that the total carbon was reduced in both the uh, prairie region and the parkland region. So total carbon pool, this includes soil carbon, root carbon, uh, above ground biomass carbon. Uh, we saw a reduction of about 28% here uh, in the prairie region. And in the parkland region, we saw a reduction of about 45%. And so this is when we have uh, grasslands that are immediately adjacent to croplands, and so we're able to sample on the uh, same ecosite um, in each of these regions, and so we saw a loss in this carbon. And so what does this really mean? So how do we get governments to understand that when, there's, when we have native prairie that there's actually um, incentive to pay to support uh, those prairie lands. To essentially, there's, you know, there's been resistance to stimulate a willingness to pay. Well, we used uh, carbon stores from the uh, Alberta Biodiversity Monitoring Institute. Uh, we used their area of, of prairie, of parkland, uh, grasslands, and croplands. And we used the $30 per ton carbon uh, equivalent, carbon dioxide equivalent from the ERA. Uh, that value is uh, coming into play uh, next year. And so when we look at the millions of tons of carbon, uh, both carbon currently retained, we're standing on somewhere between uh, $8.6 billion of carbon in the prairie and about $7.2 billion of carbon in the parkland. Um, that's carbon that we need to communicate to government that we stand to lose. This is carbon that could be lost to the atmosphere uh, in the same way uh, that previous carbon had been lost to the atmosphere. If we, if, if we decide to convert that um, to, to, to cropland, it's even more interesting to look at how much money we've already lost. And so when we use this information, when we use this mapping information and the state of the landscape in those different regions, uh, in the prairie we've lost somewhere around $8.4 billion uh, in carbon. And in the parkland region, we've lost somewhere between somewhere around $22.6 billion um, at this $30 uh, per ton CO2 equivalent uh, in that region. And so making, you know, making it clear, not only have we lost quite a bit in terms of how much carbon has been released to the atmosphere, but that we stand to lose more uh, should we uh, break those soils. Uh, and convert them to cropland is an important caveat that really doesn't come up, I think, a lot in the discussion of why we should create a willingness to pay, why we should have a market mechanism to uh, pay or incentivize uh, the protection of, of native prairie, of native grassland soil. And so once carbon is lost, we saw a little bit about this earlier. I didn't include a lot about this. Um, but once carbon is lost, how long does it take to retain that? So I don't want my message to be uh, adversarial that we shouldn't uh, produce crops. You know, we need to have a secure uh, food supply. We've come a long way. We've recovered a lot of carbon that has been lost from those initial, uh, you know, initial plowing of fields, and that needs to continue to happen. Uh, naturally revegetated uh, mixed grass prairie failed to recover uh, in root mass uh, 
for more than 50 years. And so we were able to measure uh, soil organic matter after 50 years. And so here we have root mass in grams per meter squared, um, native, native mixed grass prairie and revegetated prairie. And so we can see the differences in the grams of root mass uh, per meter squared, fairly significant. Uh, and then also the carbon concentration in those roots, the native prairie roots, again, they're, they're more carbon rich. Their concentrations of carbon are higher. Um, so this low resilience suggests that there's a long-term opportunity cost uh, with you know, carbon storage uh, in this land use conversion. So that's a long-term uh, opportunity cost with converting uh, the landscape. And so this figure just shows that native grassland soils also have generally better soil quality, soil health. So we measured a range of metrics from uh, maximum water availability, soil porosity, uh, and aggregation or fractal index. And here, native prairies outperformed uh, introduced pasture and annual cropland across the board. So they generally are providing these ecological goods and services. Uh, and again, there's not much incentive uh, for retaining those in, in the soil. Okay, so what about grazing and carbon? What's the effect of raising livestock on grasslands uh, that essentially evolved with, with bison grazing? And so we've heard from some previous talks that grazing effects on carbon are generally inconsistent. Uh, they're fairly difficult to predict. And so my earlier map showed a wide range of climate zones just within the province of Alberta. Um, and we also know that grazing changes uh, plant communities. We could go from a fescue-dominated plant community to a Kentucky bluegrass-dominated community. And so under grazing, we see significant changes in the plant species, and those species have effects on uh, the carbon that's going into the landscape um, and ultimately the entire uh, carbon cycle. So again, we measured at these uh, 100 uh, various sites throughout Alberta, over 100 sites, uh, both within uh, exclosures and outside of exclosures. And what we found was that grazing increased soil carbon concentrations, uh, particularly in the surface soil here. And so on this uh, y-axis here, we see the concentration of carbon, uh, grams carbon per kilogram of soil. Uh, and we see a significant increase in carbon under grazing uh, relative to non-grazed areas in the uh, 0 to 15 centimeter uh, soil core or soil depth. And then again, at the 15 to 30, we see a marginally significant effect. So um, we are seeing a trend towards an increase in carbon stores when these grasslands are grazed, um, likely as a result of evolving with grazers, um, also potentially as a result of compensatory growth uh, when plants are grazed. They're investing in root systems, um, ultimately putting more carbon into the soil. In addition, uh, Grazing impacted below ground vegetation as well, so grazing stimulated uh, that compensatory growth. We have data to suggest that grazing uh, increased root production um, as it increased shoot biomass. And so here we have in wetter regions a trend towards uh, grazing increasing uh, below ground biomass, below ground root production. So here we see root uh, productivity, root mass across our different uh, bioclimatic zones or, or natural subregions. Uh, and we see an increase in uh, root biomass under grazing. And so at, at this stage, you know, we've built a holistic, uh, a regional assessment of the uh, loss of carbon and the initiation of, of conversion of native grasslands. Um, as, you know, prior speakers have shown, the hard work that's going on in agricultural lands is continuing to rebuild those carbon stores, moves towards no-till or limited-till agriculture that have been incentivized are working, and so we're rebuilding those carbon stores. Um, we're also starting to see that managing lands appropriately through grazing is uh, not just uh, essentially maintaining native grasslands, but there's some potential there to stimulate uh, carbon storage in, in native prairies. and so. There is a potential there to, to want to incentivize the production of, of native grasslands. And so we have a handful of studies that are trying to fill in the gaps now uh, that we have. And so we have some current studies that are linking grazing and microorganisms, uh, microbial activity that drives the turnover, the decomposition of, of plant material um, in response to the carbon cycle and greenhouse gases. 
And so we've put litter decomposition bags out at various sites and we're monitoring the breakdown of that leaf material. Uh, we're seeing what effects grazing uh, and changes in plant species have on, on uh, decomposition rates. And so we have some data from that. We're looking at, you know, litter decomposes faster in areas uh, with grazing, but only in moisture environments like the foothills region, the foothills fescue region. Um, and so we see, you know, this could be a part of the puzzle as to why we see increased soil carbon uh, in these wetter environments. Plants are decomposing more rapidly. Some, pr some proportion of that plant material is going into the soil. Um, and ultimately is increasing. So here we see the loss of, of litter from our litter bags, the breakdown, and we see a faster decomposition rate uh, under grazing in these moister environments. In addition, uh, we see really no statistical difference in uh, carbon dioxide production or nitrous oxide uh, N2O flux in relation to grazing on the landscape. Uh, so we've been measuring uh, these greenhouse gases um, but in general, we see a trend towards uh, lower emissions of greenhouse gases in grazed agroecosystems. And so here we have uh, carbon dioxide being produced from the soil, from the landscape. Uh, and with grazing, so these Gs here, we see a general trend towards less carbon dioxide, less greenhouse gas coming off of the surface in grazed environments relative to non-grazed. But this is just a preliminary data set, a uh, preliminary trend here. We see a similar uh, trend with N2O, uh, less N2O coming off of uh, grazed grasslands relative to non-grazed grasslands. So there's potentially uh, something there that we need to investigate more, uh, and we have a, a master's student uh, working on this now, preparing her, her thesis on this um, project. In addition, uh, we have some published data here uh, showing that preliminary results showing that high intensity, low frequency, uh, defoliation in the mixed grass prairie of Alberta actually uh, took up more greenhouse gas than uh, areas that were uh, grazed uh, either were basically high intensity, high frequency. So we have a little bit of a grazing system question here. Uh, we have the amount of methane production in these systems, and we actually see that these systems are methane sinks, so they're taking up methane uh, under uh, high intensity, low frequency uh, grazing here. So these areas here on this loamy soil are actually uh, sequestering methane, uh, taking up more methane than they're giving off. And we're also starting to look at grazing systems more seriously. We have a study looking at adaptive multi-paddock grazing and its impacts on uh, pasture, pasture productivity, uh, soil health, soil carbon, greenhouse gases, and we're, we're evaluating uh, adaptive multi-paddock grazing at 30 locations. Um, it's difficult sometimes to find places where they're uh, practicing AMP um, and that we can get in and sample, uh, but we have 30 sites across the prairies in Alberta and we're looking at everything that we possibly can in terms of carbon cycling, uh, carbon storage, um, greenhouse gas, everything from greenhouse gases, measuring greenhouse gases, measuring plant productivity, uh, measuring the microbial communities, their activities, and so on and so forth. So we're trying to paint the entire picture uh, at these 30 sites that span uh, the mixed grass prairie. And so what's the current state of carbon offset programs in Alberta? You know, this comes back to the very beginning of the talk where uh, I may have mentioned that, you know, we were approached by uh, groups such as the Alberta Livestock and Meat uh, Association, ALMA, um, and they were interested in basically getting a value for native prairie. And so we know that uh, tillage systems protocol from 2009 uh, has payments for uh, reductions in carbon dioxide. Uh, through reduced and no-till agronomic practices, about a dollar per acre. But these are largely ephemeral uh, practices. You know, one of the questions I think that Mary brought up uh, yesterday was, well, I could simply go out and cut down trees on my land and I could replant trees and then I could start to collect again on these. And so the benefits from these management practices could change um, and so could the carbon that's there. So uh, we could build up carbon stocks and then we could, uh, as was mentioned earlier uh, by one of the speakers earlier, you know, we could manipulate, we could, we could play the system a, a little bit. Um, and so these are largely ephemeral. Uh, they have a, have a chance of, of going away. Currently on native prairie, there's no incentives for maintaining the existing carbon or any of those other e ecological goods and services that are provided by grasslands. Uh, and so this is despite the greater carbon levels that exist in native prairie. Um, 
and the soil health uh, that we've measured along with uh, pollination, water purification, and many other uh, benefits of native prairie uh, systems. So you know, there's, there's no market mechanism in place. Um, one of the limiting factors for that was that really holistic or, or regional data sets from more than a single ranch uh, really didn't exist for Alberta and they don't really exist for many other places um, prior to, to this project. And so for the first time, we're starting to uh, arm policymakers with data uh, to support these types of, of movements towards valuing this, uh, towards valuing this policy. And so this is sort of a working frame, framework here. Uh, you know, we have a system in place for croplands to, to regenerate, to rebuild those carbon pools. Um, we know what's been lost and we know that, that we're gaining carbon back into those systems as we've seen. Um, there's less known about, uh, you know, tame forage systems and there's even less known about native prairie and there's, there's even less incentive to maintain carbon in native prairie. Um, but, you know, with more, as more data becomes available, um, you know, we're likely to, to increase awareness about uh, the ecological goods and services um, and the reality that we stand to lose quite a lot if we don't value um, uh, these systems. And so the big take home message here is, is that, you know, native grasslands, they produce and they provide an abundance of EGNS for not only the producers in the room, not only the science, uh, scientists and researchers in the room, but Everybody across Canada, everybody across North America, uh, people around the globe benefit from native prairie. Um, in comparison to, to cropland, they have a higher stock of carbon oftentimes, uh, improved soil health, greater pollination, greenhouse gas uptake as we've seen. Um, and with work underway, you know, doing these large scale studies, um, we're hoping to develop policy and inform policymakers, provide them with the information that they need to go forward with with uh, these types of, of policies. Um, in addition, we've seen that you know, moderate grazing on the landscape actually increases soil carbon. Um, and so part of that is, is likely due to climate situation. So you have to, you have to know and understand uh, where you're grazing and how you're grazing, but also that many of these plants evolved with grazers, with bison, uh, and they do well with, with bison. They've, they've ultimately survived with them for thousands of years, and so by, uh, by grazing these lands, we're actually stimulating biological activity with plants and microbes that's uh, ultimately leading to the formation of, of soil carbon. And so I just want to acknowledge uh, several students that have helped with this, Mark Lysing, uh, Donald Schoderbeck, uh, Sean Schwan, Kate Stolnikova, uh, Monica Kohler, Ashton Sturm. Uh, these are all graduate students whose uh, data I've, I've poached for this talk. Um, and Scott Chang, Guillermo Hernandez, uh, Ramirez and Christina Hebb are all uh, researchers at the University of Alberta. Also our funding uh, came from Alberta Innovates Biosolutions, uh, Alberta Agriculture and Forestry. Uh, without AEP and without the producers who granted us access to their, to their land, none of this would really be possible. Um, and Agriculture and Agri-Foods Canada and the emissions reductions uh, in Alberta. And so, you know, takeaway from this is that, you know, native prairies are really valuable and we need to value them better. Um, and, and I'll take any questions that anyone might have. Okay.